Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Soul Patrol Jesus 911. My name is Jesse Romero. I'm a one man car. I'm waiting for Kyle Clement. I think they're trying to get a hold of Kyle. Uh, my my partner Eddie. He's off today. He's out doing some apostolic work. But uh, there's several things I want to talk to Kyle about as we get him on. We want to talk about uh, portals to hell. Does that really exist? We're going to talk about. Uh, a confessor versus a, a a priest trained in exorcism. Oh, so a trained exorcist versus a confessor. And we're also going to talk about witchcraft and the way it's being normalized and is trying to be pushed towards our children. So uh, let me just start off with an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I see Kyle. Kyle's on. Kyle, can you hear me? I got you, Jesse. All right. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left and aided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear us and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Kyle, well, welcome, Two Man Car, myself and Kyle Clement. Hey, Kyle, let me just let's go right to the very beginning. How did Kyle Clement from Texas become involved in healing and deliverance and find your way in Oklahoma? Uh, Jesse, How did God never, put you into this? Never look at a priest and say, Father, whatever I can do to help you, just let me know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Um, several years ago, as a, um, as a fruit of prayer, um, my heritage and education is somewhat scattered and, and you really don't look realize how the Lord is shaping you for a particular thing until you look back with a retrograde aspect. And so my heritage is that of herding and ranching. And so herd health, dominion versus domination, how to draw your living from the land and from animals with a harmonious and sustainable existence. That's my heritage. I'm the seventh generation of herder, cowboys, sheep herders uh, in this country. And it goes back beyond that into northern Italy and the highlands of Scotland. And so that's in my heritage. That's in my blood. That's what I've done most of my life. Then I was called to pursue uh, an education in the law, uh, more from an estates, wills, and contracts standpoint than anything else. I never practiced law uh, publicly, did privately and and for family and for, for other groups. And then when those two things came together within the herding and within the legal aspect, I was fascinated by the concept of predation. How does a predator work on an individual animal? How does a predator work on a herd? How is a herd managed actually by predators for long-term predation uh, around the edges? What marginalizes an animal? What makes them vulnerable to predation? And you can take every one of those observations and move it directly over into what how the demonic preys upon the human. And so both both individually, uh, well, all three, as an individual, in a family, and then in a larger communal construct, such as a parish, a religious community, a church. It's very, very predictable. And so I started sharing the, re- the fruit of these reflections with a priest. He was in a mission um, parish in a corner of Texas, um, my granddad used to say, you can't, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from here. <laughs> and so it's a pretty desolate, isolated part of, of Southwest Texas. And um, I began sharing this with this confessor. And so in the economy of salvation, one of the reasons he was out there is so that he could practice exorcism and his pastoral load was not so heavy. I didn't know this. He asked if I would pray with people. I didn't know, not know what that was. And he said, I was totally unfamiliar with any kind of charismatic prayer group or praying with and over people. What he wanted me to do was simply go into the home of these people, pray, and then report back to him what my observations or intuitions were. First and foremost, understand I have no 
charismatic gift. I've got no gift whatsoever. Um, maybe the gift of skepticism. <laughs> <laughs> so when I talked with them, the way that I thought and saw it, I shared this with father. He prayed with the family and there was an undiagnosed medical problem with a 14 year old girl that, that cleared up. It's not a miraculous healing. That's a re- that's addressing a, an extraordinary diabolical affliction that God is allowing for the purpose of conversion and salvation. So are you still in contact with this priest? Uh, God rest his soul. He's passed. Oh, okay. okay. And, and so, um, but what he said was, would you, would you continue to, would you talk with some other priests and would you b- accompany me on some visits? Home visits is what he called them. And they were actually formal right exorcism. And so I began to accompany him, quote, on these home visits. And then he um, began to introduce other priests. And so in a short period of time, I was in contact with several priests from around the country who would call with various scenarios and things. The most of my um, in-person ministry at that time, early 2000s, was on the border of Texas, down the uh, Mexican border of Texas. And so we saw a lot of stuff. Um, We actually crossed over into Mexico a couple of times at the request of the bishop. And what was happening back then, a lot of people thought that the Catholic Church had abandoned exorcism. We had not. We had not at all. Uh, It was still being done largely uh, under the radar by order priests who had the ability to travel. And so, if anything, accurately, it had been removed from the parish priest. It had been removed from what's called the secular priest or diocesan priesthood. Understand that the diocesan priesthood is an anomaly that shows up after Vatican II. Prior to Vatican II, most of the parish priests were order priests. If they were diocesan or secular, they had previously been order priests. But this idea that The diocesan priest who operates alone and without communal support, this is a dangerous construct. And we see it have, I think it largely contributed to um, some of the um, scandals that we're now going through is the isolation of priests, both order priests and diocesan priests. But I digress to me. Yep. Makes sense to me. I digress. And so that was how I first got started. And then along about 2004 or five, um, a priest, a Lebanese priest from Pennsylvania called, and uh, he identified himself as Monsignor John Essa, and he asked if I would consult on some cases. So I began to consult with Monsignor Essa, who is the exorcist emeritus in the United States. Right. Probably probably one of the um, most, um, just a really, really special individual. This is a grand nephew, grand, grand nephew of St. Charbel. Um, this guy's got serious cred. He is, he is the real deal. And so I began to, um, consult with him and then he invited me to Mundelein. There was a group of conferences going on every summer in Mundelein, healing and deliverance in the Catholic tradition led by Dr. Margaret Slintz, who is a female, uh, PhD in clinical psychology who had been involved in the charismatic renewal. And she began this, these conferences. And so what would happen is I would go to Mundelein uh, for a week every summer and Monsignor Esif and I and two others would minister to people while all the talks were going on. So for the first three years I went to Mundelein, I never heard a talk. Wow. <laughs> I, I was working just simply because all these people came in. And so we were in prayer 16 to 18 hours a day and, and it was really an eye opener. It was really amazing to be around um, other people involved in this. I was invited in 2008 by Monsignor Essa to begin the development of um, the Pope Leo XIII Institute. It was unnamed at that time, but the USCCB had asked uh, Monsignor Essa to develop a school for exorcism. And so he asked um, me and several others um, to be involved in that. So I was involved in the Leo from the Exploratory Committee on. I had met Father Ripperger at one of the summer Mundelein conferences. He and I had kept in contact, compared notes on various cases and various things, and we became very good friends. Um, and so then that association just grew. And so that by the time the Leo, uh, the 13th Institute held its first cohort, 
in February of 2014, Father Ripperger and I had been instrumental or, or been present to the development of every bit of the curriculum from the ground up. And so all of the current LEO board members, leadership, all of those are former students. And so they went through, many of them went through the first cohort. And so we, be, we began that under a tremendous amount of opposition. And so for the first two or three years, one of my primary activities was to pray um, anywhere from three to four hours a day for the protection and integrity of the, uh, of the institution. Monsignor Essef charged me with that. He says, I want you to be a watcher on the wall. I want you to see what's coming against us. I want you to tell us. I want you to, to be in this position. So that's what he asked me to do. That's what I did for five years. And so um, then Father Ripperger and I discerned that the Leo was moving in different directions, more of an ecumenical direction, less a charge of its mandate. Um, and so, um, he and I, um, parted company. Um, Leo asked me to leave, uh, father left on his own accord. Leo asked me to leave because I, um, I lack some diplomacy and that's probably on purpose. I'm just going to tell you how it is. Um, hold that thought. I, I want to hear the se- Hold that thought. That's a teaser. So people could hang on. We're talking to Kyle Clement. And uh, we're asking how this uh, this uh, sheep herder and, and farmer got involved in healing, deliverance, and exorcism. Don't change that dial. He's going to share more next. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is Jesse Romero. Join me on a pilgrimage of faith and discovery to Poland for the 100th year anniversary of the birth of St. John Paul II in May of 2020. Together we'll experience the faith, beauty, and culture of Poland and become imbibed with the spirit of John Paul II. We'll visit the town of Wadowice, where John Paul was born, and the city of Krakow, where he was ordained and later became bishop. We'll also travel to Jasnogora and visit Our Lady of Czestochowa, and we'll have a chance to venerate the original image of the merciful Jesus at St. Faustina's convent and the city that St. Maximilian Kolbe built for the Immaculata. Finally, we'll pay a visit to Auschwitz, where St. Maximilian Kolbe was martyred. This is the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to worship and discover your own faith at places where St. John Paul II grew in his own love for our Lord. For more information or how to join this pilgrimage, visit my website at jesseromero.com. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. According to St. John Paul II, being a Christian means saying yes to Jesus Christ. It consists in surrendering to the word of God and relying on it, but also endeavoring to know better and better the profound meaning of this word. May God grant that we always rely on his word, read it often, and put it into practice. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888 526 2151. Jesus 911, two man car, Jess Romero, Kyle Clement. Uh, Kyle, well, thanks for sharing with us. Uh, let's get right into the topics, but I just wanted you to put a plug in for Liber Cristo and tell us who is Liber Cristo and what service where they provide for the Catholic Church before we get into our first topic. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Jesse. Father, uh, one of the things that Father Ripper and I 
wanted to um, correct and redirect was the concept of lay assistance and lay team formation, which assists the exorcist and the bishop in administrating cases in uh, responding, if you will, to the phenomenon of extraordinary diabolical affliction. So over a period of years, I had been doing team formation for the LEO for several years, traveling around the country, developing and, and forming teams that would help the exorcist and the bishop within a given diocese. And so we came up with a set methodology, uh, the protocol, if you will, four-phase protocol. You can go to LibreCristo.com to be uh, familiarize yourself with some of these. But the two big pillars of Libre Cristo is a set protocol that responds in true Christian charity to the possibility of extraordinary diabolical activity. First of all, determining, is there extraordinary diabolical activity? The second phase goes into removing impediments to grace. That is a program called Freedom Through Christ, which is the Catholic methodology for liberation. It places at the center a return to the sacraments and the inclusion of the Blessed Mother as um, being necessary in our Catholic faith. And it's uh, what we found was in built FTC around the principles of analyzing a huge data set, what inhibits or what keeps people from achieving liberation. And no matter whether it was oppression, obsession or possession, what we found prolonged the cases and prevented liberation was impediments to grace. And they are in the following order based upon um, percentage of occurrence. The highest percentage of, of cases that was failing to liberate, there was some degree of unforgiveness or retained habitual mortal sin. And so FTC systematically goes through and identifies the impediments to grace and sets about removing them so that the soul can attain a set of grace, a, a, a state of grace. The second most common was defect in virtue. Defect meaning uh, a lack of balance and or practice in the four cardinal virtues, as well as being open to the three theological virtues. Just a teaser on this, go to LibreCristo.org. This stuff is all available, but it's the Catholic approach. It's the understanding that we are responsible for opening ourselves to grace. It does not matter what anyone has done to us. We are sovereign. We are responsible for our response to that event, and it has to be a Catholic response. It has to be reparation. It has to be redemptive suffering. It has to be embracing whatever has come our way. And so that's the, the second most common. The third um, is power and authority, meaning someone is outside the natural order. Someone is outside the not right line of authority, as St. Paul described, as the church fathers described, as all moral theology textbooks talked about the natural order and how grace flows through the natural order Prior to 1960, all theological, uh, moral theology textbooks had this. And so this was an understanding that we had. And then in the 60s, as the shift was away from creator and more toward creature, we literally went from ad orientum, focused on God, to ad hominem, focused on the human. Then we lost this moral theology grounding and the understanding of right order, authority and power. And so FTC is designed along those three things. So please go to Libra Cristo and familiarize yourself with these these um, these methodologies. And so Father and I and, and some others developed these. They've been in usage for over a year at this point, and they're yielding very, very good results simply because it, re it places a emphasis on the redefining of healing as reconciliation with God the Father through the sacraments, not a cessation of physical suffering. Kyle, would you say that as Catholics, for probably for decades, because there was a lack of, let's say, this type of instruction, Liber Christu, the Pope, the, the Leo the Thirteenth, as a result of the lack of of instruction, Catholics for many decades have borrowed from Protestant models, Protestant books of deliverance, and uh, and they've brought them into the Catholic Church, unbeknownst to them, because of again, uh, it. it lack of formation in proper catechesis. And for many decades, Catholics have been using the Protestant model of deliverance. And uh, that opens a person or your family. If you're outside of your authority, it opens you up to retaliation. Is this one of the reasons why 
you saw the need for uh, for uh, starting uh, Libra Christu is going back to a Catholic model, a, a, a total Catholic model of healing and deliverance, and abandoning the Protestant model, which uh, has too many holes in it. Uh, is that one of the reasons why you guys started Libra Christo? That is precisely right, Jesse. It's extremely accurate because what was happening was the practitioners were becoming cases. Those who practice these Protestant models, which essentially places the layman in the role of the priest, um, because all of these roles, male roles, female roles, priest, father, uh, spouse, all of these roles were purposely confused during the 60s. And when you buy into that and when you practice that, you're outside the natural order, you're going to get beat up. And so what we were finding was is that a lot of our practitioners were actually becoming cases because of the disordered power and authority issue. Mm, got it. That makes sense. Uh, Kyle, I want to just ask you a question. There's a couple of articles that I, that, that I brought up, and I want to ask you a question about this term called portals or portals to hell. I'm looking at this one article here where uh, they're talking. It's, it's, a, it's, argue, it's an article about a real estate agent, and they're selling this house. And let me read what it says here. Uh, the BC Real Estate Association estimates that at least 30% of detached homes in Metro Vancouver and 10% of condos contain portals to other worlds. But approximately half of them lead to high fantasy realms and increase the value of the property. It says, the realtor says, Arnold Lee, portals to hell are, an, are a niche feature. It's true. <clears throat> They're more popular with horror movie loving millennials, but unfortunately tend to open up when the wealthy make packs with demons and are therefore mostly found in expensive homes which millennials can't afford, so we're seeing a glut of every high-end homes. So we're seeing a glut of very high-end homes with hell portals on the market. Kyle, from a Catholic point of view, what is a portal to hell? What are they talking about here? Break it down for the layman. Okay, one of the first things to remember as we, as we break it down is the understanding that everything they do on the other side is a counterfeit or a corruption of what we do on our side. Okay. In, in one hour, I'm going to go to a portal. On Sunday, you were at a portal. Matt, yeah, this morning, I was, I, was, I was at Mass. I was at a portal this morning. Nicely. And so what's going to happen in an hour is I'm going to a funeral. And in that funeral, we're going to commend a soul to God. And at the end of the Requiem Mass, the, the, the High Requiem Mass, the priest will incense the coffin and this soul will ride that incense in our prayers to God. The other side is very, very well aware of the office of the dead in the Catholic liturgy. We are not. The other side is very aware of the power in our liturgy, in our prayers. We are not. And so what happens is a, a portal is a place where there is an opening between the worlds. At the epiclesis, when the bells ring and the, plea, and the priest calls down the Holy Spirit, it is as if a shaft is opened to the throne room of God. And that mass, there is a direct fiber optic from that mass, from that altar to God Almighty. That's a portal in the right sense. Now, when, when someone offers worship or sacrifice to Satan, a portal is also offered. Uh, is opened. What makes the portal more accessible is repetition, holiness, devotion. And so just invert that. And you see that the wealthy part of their agreement is blood sacrifice. And in many of these homes, what's going to happen is this is going to become more and more apparent. It's going to be in the news. It's right on the edge of the news right now. But politicians, others in positions of power are sacrificing children in this country for this purpose, for the purpose of gaining power. It's happening. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is simply what's coming out of the mouth of, of the possessed who have been at these places and who want out. They, they're telling you what they've witnessed. It's coming out of the mouth of the demonic who is being dispelled through exorcism. There, there's too much continuity to the stories across around the world. Um, the demon is drawn to power Power is drawn to the demon, and often it is the thirst for power that draws the diabolical to an individual. 
And then it's that individual's ability to perfect blood sacrifice or perversion that empowers him with the demon. Kyle, you just said something that just the light went on. The light went on upstairs. I never thought about it in that way. Every time you go to Holy Mass, there's a portal that opens. We can't see where, you know, a heaven comes down to earth and there's a touchstone. I know that theologically, but I never realized that the enemy, the other guys, they know the power of the mass, that it opens up a portal to heaven and heaven and earth touch, you know, touch. There's a touchstone there. The other side, they're trying to open portals to the other world, to the kingdom of darkness, because they know it can happen with the kingdom of light in the Catholic Church and the Catholic Mass. I never saw that connection, but that makes that makes sense to me. As Catholics, we don't use the term haunted house. We use the term uh, in, a house infested. Why do we say infested instead of haunted? Because 90% of hauntings are demons masquerading as human spirits. Um, St. Charles Borromeo in the Frenotunda of the Formal Rite of 1614, paragraph 11 of the Norme, was very, very adamant about this. He said, if something shows up at an exorcism identifying itself as a disembodied spirit or a human, you're not to, to pay it any attention. Because the purpose is to derail the prayer. And so purgative souls are very, very closely regulated about what they can do. And it's very, very rare when they appear. Um, but the idea of a haunting of a house and all of the emotional and physiological response to the horror and the fear, that's diabolically fueled. That's, that's not purgative. Got it. And uh, so as Catholics, some of the big blockbuster movies that, you know, fascinate Catholics, Amityville Horror, you know, the Conjuring and stuff. Some of these movies I've read, they were taken from actual cases that, uh, you know, that actually occurred somewhere in, in, in the East Coast. Uh, what would you say about things like the Amityville Horror, the Conjuring? Uh, can that really happen? You gonna catch this on the other side? Yeah, yeah. Think chew on chew on that. We want to ask you about uh are these things embellished Hollywood uh drama or can this really happen? And do you know of cases where there's been a, an acute infestation uh of the diabolical in the house? Uh Jesus 911, two man car, Justin Cal will be back. This is Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This March, VMPR, in association with the Catholic Resource Center, will be hosting a special conference for the Adoramus Society. Adoramus at the Triduum, a conference on the spirituality of the Triduum liturgies. Featuring speakers Father Joseph Fessio, Dr. Anthony Lillis, and Christopher Karstens, addressing such topics as developing a liturgical spirituality, the spirituality of Holy Thursday, the spirituality of Good Friday, and the spirituality of the Paschal Vigil and Easter season. It all takes place March 14, 2020, at the historic Sacred Heart Chapel at 381 West Center Street, Covina, California, 91723. You can register online at vmpr.org or call now at 877-526-2151 to reserve your seat today. For Adoramus at the Triduum. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting. Virgin Most Powerful Radio, and it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. We're back. Jesus 911, two-man car. Jess Romero, Kyle Clement. Talking on spiritual warfare topics. And uh, we're going to just uh, broach that topic. Kyle, there's been a lot of movies made about haunted houses by Hollywood. You know, Amityville Horror, for example. I think The Omen, The Conjuring. They they allege that a lot of these house, uh, a lot of these movies are made or based on true stories. Is that your experience? Is that true or false? And can this really happen? That that type of acute activity can that happen in a house? In your experience, uh, as uh, somebody who's trained in this field. Okay, several questions there. First of all, I'll make a general observation that if your knowledge of any vocation or occupation comes from the movies, <laughs> you you're fooled. Um, Jesse, you were a deputy, deputy sheriff. Does it look just like it did on chips? No, no. Yeah. You, yeah. No, not at all. I'm a, I grew up a cowboy and I used to watch the cowboy movies thinking, man, who really does this stuff? <laughs> and so I think that first and foremost is you tap the brakes of common sense and say, okay, it's not really that way. Exorcism is long, hard work. It's a grind both for the energument and the exorcist. Tremendous amount of prayer comes from a solid interior life. The manifestations can be very dramatic, can be very violent. Um, they don't happen with the frequency and the uh, length that you see in the movies. The movies are selling seats, popcorn, and soda pop. Um, an exorcism is removing the diabolical. And so it's two very different things. The cases will, when it says based on a true story, what I always like to point out is the first word in that statement is based. It, it's not exactly what happened. It is based. And so you're taking elements of the story to lend credibility. And so immediately uh, the audience comes away saying, OK, did that really happen? And did it really happen the way it was in the movie? And um while there are extraordinary things, it's extraordinary diabolical activity, and there are things that can't be explained by physics and nature, it is also extremely reg regulated. It's only The demon is only allowed to do what our Lord allows him to do. One of the things that I've noticed, though, especially in this Libra Cristo model, is that as you progress through this and the soul has an opportunity to attain a state of grace prior to the formal exorcism, there are many less, much less uh, manifestations. This person is more sovereign in their will and more in control. And so, for instance, in the original Exorcist movie, during the exorcism, part of the, the file was that the, the family had been heavily involved in the occult and were still involved in the occult while the exorcisms were going on. So literally, you've got what Jesus said is you've got a house divided. Hmm. And so while they're, they're saying, deliver my daughter, make the manifestation stop, they're not yet ready to yield to God and to come to God. And so we see that is a very big basic shift that's missing in the movies is the conversion of the family, the prayers of the family, the prayers of everybody involved. And it is literally a movement from the left side of Jesus to the right side of Jesus, from the bad thief, the unrepentant thief, to the good thief, to Dismas, to the repentant thief who calls upon the Lord, Lord, remember me, I'm justly condemned. We, this is a big moment in every exorcism case. It's totally omitted in all the movies. Liberation will not come until there's conversion. Makes sense. Uh, everything that I've read uh, from all the experts, you got it. 
the, the, the person has to embrace a life of, a, of grace, of sanctifying grace and the family as well for there to be full healing. Let me ask you a question. There's an article I have here. It says demonic possession should be handled by trained exorcists, not confessor. I want you to uh, give me your thoughts on this article. It says <clears throat> Bishop Girodo said that when a person believes he's dealing with a case of diabolical possession, it should be handled by an exorcist instead of a confessor. And uh, the bishop said during a seminar that in cases of visions, he says diabolical, mystic, and supposedly supernatural phenomenon, the confessor should be particularly prudent and experienced, and the intervention of an exorcist uh, in in these complex and delicate cases, uh, he says, uh, Bishop Giroda said, he spoke of the crisis, also the sacrament of reconciliation, and noted that according to recent statistics, 30% 30% of the faithful in Italy do not see the need for confession and 20% find talking about their sins with others difficult. So here's my question. The first one is this. Is there a humongous difference between a trained exorcist and just a priest confessor giving spiritual direction or just a good or just a good confessor in the confessional? Uh, can't they provide some assistance to the energumen just by making good, thoughtful confessions and by the priest's absolution, uh, or or are some cases uh, above and beyond just a simple confessor and needs a trained exorcist? It appears to be a simple question, but it's complicated on several issues. And so let's look at the complications and then derive it at, at an answer. First of all, there are three modern complications to the sacrament of penance. First of all, His Excellency Miss miss calls this this sacrament was known uh, for centuries as a sacrament of confession or the sacrament of penance the name of the sacrament has always been known for the action and so baptism it's known as the sacrament of baptism it's not known as the sacrament of cleanliness the sacrament of first communion so the thing that I will point out that Libra Cristo makes it a point, and this is one of the reasons that it is the Catholic methodology for liberation, is we understand the sacraments, the ordering of the sacraments in a pre-1960 configuration because terms become horribly mixed after 1960. So there was a clear understanding that the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of confession, was a prerequisite to all sacraments. Let me clarify that because modernly we're taught Baltimore Catechism teaches very clearly penance is, is a prerequisite. Modernly we teach baptism is the first sacrament. It's not. Anytime we request a sacrament, anytime we present ourselves to be in the presence of a sacrament, the calling down of the Holy Spirit into a body, we must be in a state of grace. Unless you're a baby, of course, unless you're an infant. Well, and the infant, the one who goes to confession are the parents and the godparents because they're requesting the sacrament on behalf of the child. Then starting with First Communion confirmation, as soon as there's an age of reason element requisite with the sacrament within any given diocese, confession is a prerequisite. We are dealing with a multitude of obsession cases. Now, obsession is a unique category, but we're dealing with a lot of these in millennials who were told by their CCD teacher, by their sacramental prep, they didn't have to go to confession before First Communion. They didn't have to go to confession before confirmation. And so they're having diabolical affliction because the sacrament was not done according to the formula. So that's the the necessity and the importance of the sacrament of reconciliation modernly, which has been in the past called the sacrament of penance and confession is necessary to open the soul to grace. We must confess our sins to be open to grace. Very simple. Um, this is this is theology that is unchallenged. And so what happens is that the confession is way more powerful than the exorcism, way more powerful. But the analogous thing is this is preventative medicine versus radical, uh, uh, a radical surgery. If I'm going to my doctor and I say, I've got a pain under my right arm and it's just started, then he can address that. 
if I wait and I'm silent and I go to my doctor when I got a 40 pound tumor and I can't lower my arm, now it's different. And so diabolical affliction that builds up over a period of time is a tumor that grows based upon habitual mortal sin. The problem, second problem we have is that modernly we have counselors, not confessors. We have priests who are counseling. They're not confessing. They're not spiritual directors. They're therapists. And they're they're giving they're bringing modern psychology and the dysfunctional idea of how to cope into the confessional where it has no place. The confession needs to challenge you. He needs to help you scrub your soul. He needs to, to say, you're a married man. You can't think these thoughts. You can't do these things. You have responsibilities and obligations. We don't hear that language anymore in the confessional. Third problem, face-to-face confessional without a barrier. What a travesty. The idea that we could actually make physical contact with a priest during the sacrament of confession is absolutely ridiculous. The screen had a very real purpose. His Excellency brings up a point, but all the exorcists that I know, and they they strongly advocate that the priest hear confession behind the screen where no physical contact is possible where no direct eye contact is possible. In that case, if the person is possessed, the priest has a safety. His humanity has a safety because what the possessed will do is bring them to a compromised state through progression. They will project upon them either sins or images that are impure, unholy. um, And if they can get physical contact then there is a transference. And so the priest is open to the transference if there is fear or lack of trust in God. And what I've just gone through is about a three-day teaching that priests need to really, really get a hold of. But they can become extraordinarily diabolically afflicted, and their priesthood can be compromised if they make contact, physical contact in the confessional. That's not the way the sacrament was practiced for years. It's not the way it's written. And nobody is teaching these guys how to hear confessions and how to prepare themselves for the sacrament. So based on all those points being made, modernly, if you're not hearing, if if speaking to the priest, if you're not hearing it with the screen and with the separation, if you're not understanding the difference between counseling and confession, if you're wanting to give Uh, uh, therapy instead of spiritual direction then yeah you better call an exorcist but if you've got your game on and you know how to do this you can do it got it Jesus 911 stick around don't turn that dial good stuff we'll be back Hello, this is Terry Barber with the Terry and Jesse Show. I'm here with Gil already. He is the president of the Catholic Men's Fellowship of California. Gil, we got a men's conference coming up. I appreciate you having me on, Terry, to share about our Rise Up, O Men of God, the Church for You Does Wait, Super Saturday Conference, and it's Saturday, March 28th in Covina at Sacred Heart Catholic Church, 344 West Workman Street in Covina, California. Who are the speakers? We have some great speakers lined up. We have Steve Ruda, former captain of the L.A. Fire Department. He's dynamic. Mm -hmm. He's energetic. He will really keep the conference moving. We have Monsignor Tim Nichols, the pastor from St. John Vianney's. He's dynamic. Mark McElrath, Father Darren Merlino, a trained exorcist. Charlie Eshelman, a past Navy SEAL. We have Deacon Omar Uriati, who is from our parish, St. Louis de Marillac, and Father Joseph Shea. And I'll be there myself, giving a little plug for Virgin Most Powerful. You can reach us at catholicmen.org. Tickets are on sale there. Just follow the link. Tickets are on sale at eventbrite.com. Just be sure to get your tickets now till the 31st for $35 and $45 after that till the day of the conference. Sign up for this men's conference. Call Gil at 626-841-9090. I'll be sure to answer your call and give you all the information you need for the Rise Up, O Men of God, for you, the Church Does Wait Conference. Thank you, Terry. Appreciate your help. God bless you.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Toll Patrol, Jesus 911, two-man car, Catholic intel and briefing for your war bag so you can go out there and uh, make a difference. Carl, you use the word, and I want you to just define it for the audience, give us an explanation. Uh, Give us an explanation, a fuller explanation. I've heard you and Dan use it often. You say the demon projects in your mind. Can you break that down for the lay person? What do you mean when you say the demon projects in your mind? Okay. First of all is to understand the communication between incorporeal creatures. So the the demon is a fallen angel. So he's created without a corpus. Um, He does not have the ability to speak on his own. He can't do the things that a physical body allows us to do. So he's pure intellect and will. As we descend through the faculties, as St. Thomas describes them, there is intellect, will, and then memory and emotion. And so both memory and emotion have physical aspects to them that we experience both in our physical nature and in our spiritual nature. The demon can only experience them in his spiritual nature. But as far as limited communication, he projects, meaning he brings forth a concept in his intellect and then he projects it by his will. Temptation is a lower form of projection. It's suggestion. But temptation becomes extraordinary when the diabolical has access to your interior and proje- and projects um, different things. For instance, how many of, of any of us have had random thoughts of violence or perversion that fleet across our mind and we're thinking, you know, that's just not my stuff. And so you reject it. It moves on. That's possibly a diabolical projection. The moment that we entertain it, it's a drive by, so to speak. It's, it's a drive by. The demon drives by and he projects this thought and you don't pick anything up. You don't entertain it. Then he missed But if he drives by and he projects that thought of perversion and you react, then he's like, oh, I'm going to circle the block and come back and I'm going to drive slower and I'm going to take better aim and I'm going to see just how much of this I can I can um, get him to engage in. If you engage in it, if you entertain the thought and the projection grows and the vividness grows, this is how he drives our fallen nature is the demon of larceny is not going to suggest to go get drunk. He's just simply going to suggest steal something or you deserve something. So they work true to their fallen nature. So projection is the diabolical projection is the best word um, of an idea or a concept. And then the more you entertain that and the more you develop a relationship with the demon, you begin to speak with him. The model of this is in the garden. This is exactly what happens between Eve and the snake. She's looking at the fruit. The demon sees her, and then he puts voice to her thought through the serpent, doubting God. That's once he can get, yeah, yeah. Once he gets a conversation started with her, now he's inside. They're actually talking. Kyle, is this? It, I think. It, would this also fit with Ephesians six sixteen, where St. Paul warns us, he says, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. I've always wondered, okay, what are the fiery? We know it's not literal, obviously. The fiery arrows of the devil, Ephesians six sixteen. Based on what you said, projection, this totally makes sense now. Ephesians six sixteen, that would be the fiery arrows of the devil, uh, projecting his uh, through his intellect uh, thoughts into our mind. I mean, to me, it makes sense. I mean, there's a direct correlation there. The fire, because obviously he's not throwing literal darts at us. What's he doing? He's projecting. And so what you just said to me, Ephesians 6.16, just 
exploded in my mind right now. Does that make sense? Oh, it absolutely does. And this is the way we, we, we teach it at Libra Cristo. You're dead on. Now let's apply it to something really, really practical that we're all talking about. It's a, let's apply it to a curse. So what's happening is, is you're safe behind your shield of faith. You're safe behind there. And what he says is, he doesn't say that the fiery darts will have no effect. He says they won't kill you. And so <laughs> big difference. You, you've worn a bulletproof vest. You've worn a flak jacket. You get shot in a bulletproof vest. It's not going to kill you, but you're going to have a mark. You're going to have a bruise. It hurts like hell, and it'll knock you down. But it ain't going to kill you. That's the shield of faith. Now then, the bulletproof vest analogy works really good here because the closer I am to the shooter, the more effect it's going to have, even though it doesn't kill me. And if I'm totally out of range, this thing's just going to pop off me. So what does out of range and in range mean? What is your relationship to the person person who is hurling the curse? Hmm. Curses are fiery darts. And so we're safe behind our shield and we, we feel one hit. And like a fool, we lower the shield of faith to see where it came from. Now we're going hit, to get hit square in the face. What you need to do is keep the shield of faith up and retreat, praying for whoever's flinging the fiery dart. This is where St. Paul says, you know, be kind to your enemies. It's like heaping coals on their head. But what we find over and over is people want to say, how do I break the curse? Breaking the curse is of no value because they're going to hurl another one. It's not about breaking the curse. It's about getting small enough to fit within your armor and then getting downrange so that you no longer are allowing this person to offend you and you're actually praying for them. That's what stops the curse. And that's what stops it in a way that glory, gives glory to God. But the hardest curses to break are family members among family members. Sister-in-laws against sister-in-laws. Brother-in-laws against brother-in-laws. Wives and mothers against siblings and, and in-laws. Jesse, you live in a cursing culture. I live in a cursing culture. It just takes different forms. And this is really the functional lesson here and exactly what you're talking about, the fiery darts of the devil and the projections, because what the curse will immediately do is you will get ill. Suppose this curse works on your, your GI tract. So the moment your bowels get loose, you think of Uncle Bob and the hatred comes up. Do you see the response? And so I've just been removed from the battlefield. Now a, a flesh wound becomes a mortal wound because of my anger. I'm not praying for Bob. I'm, I'm worrying about how this is affecting me. And this is why Jesus tells us, obviously, in the Gospels, he says, uh, you know, pray for your enemies, you know, uh, pray for the, he actually says, pray for those who curse you. Uh, those are those are very difficult words to, to live by, but that's what he says. Pray for those who curse you. And that's exactly, exactly what, yeah, that's exactly what you just said right now. And, and that's spiritual jujitsu. It is spiritual turning of the momentum right back into uh, turning an evil to good. It's not some um, Harry Krishna sitting cross-legged saying, I'm praying for my enemies. This is a militant stance, man. When you pray for your enemies, this is taking it to them in the battle. This is converting them. Now, let me ask you a question talking about curses now. Uh, you know that... Uh, there is a network of witches around the country that were using social media to actually uh, liturgically put curses on our president. I think they were doing it like once a month. I haven't followed it in, any longer, um, but they were promoting it, uh, you know, hexes and curses against the president. So my question, what can we as Catholics, even Protestants, people of, you know, separated brothers, what can we do? on a practical level, to protect our president from these hexes and curses? Well, I think better than, uh, yeah, uh, that's a that's a first thing. But more importantly and deeper, our Lord's thirst for souls. What must be done to convert these women? What must be done to, to bring them even to, to halfway to a state of grace? And that is, Lord, may whatever they're sending against the present, president be returned tenfold against them but in the form of a blessing and so the projection is 90 percent of these women are loose women and what i mean by that is a very theological term meaning they're not under right authority 
The typical witch is not under right authority. She's a loose woman. In the in the breastplate of Saint Mike, uh, Saint Patrick, it talks about protect us from women witches and druids. The women there, that's not meaning female. That's meaning a woman who is not under authority. She doesn't have a husband, doesn't have a spiritual authority. She's her own boss, and so she is trapped in the in the illusion of power. She's trapped by the feminist spirit militating against her, what will save her. And so what you're sending back is a projection of all the lost joys of motherhood, all the lost joys of right spousal union, all the lost joys of right daughterhood, all the lost joys of being in right order to God Almighty. And so when you project that, projection's fought with projection. Our biggest weapon here is the rosary. Project the mystery. The first joyful mystery, the Annunciation. See the Blessed Mother kneeling at the well in Nazareth. See the stones. Smell the sun on the stones. See the shadow of Gabriel fall in that courtyard. And hear him say, Ave Maria. And watch her turn and behold the angel. The more vivid you can see that in your mind and project it with love of God, now this is a two-edged sword which cuts the diabolical off. I love it. I never thought about that. Just make those images in your mind as you're praying. Obviously, that's called meditation. Uh, yeah, that's that's some good stuff for the for the war bag. Kyle, does it surprise you that the Disney Channel is uh, introducing witchcraft through a through a TV show to our kids? Does that surprise you? A and B. What would you say to parents? Is this is this innocuous? Is this harmless? Uh, these cartoons uh, promoting witchcraft. What would you tell mom and dad? No, there's no way it's harmless. Let's watch the trajectory of, of what Walt has begotten. <laughs> begotten. Um, we, we get disorder in talking animals. We get all kinds, of, even though it's fanciful, but it's an elevation of the animal. It's an elevation of the animal out of the, the right order of things. Then let's look at how uh, people would interact just in the Disney movies. He's always, he was always just a little ahead of the curve with regard to the degradation of marriage. Uh, with homosexuality, with the fostering of the agenda, which is against the integrity of the sacraments, the integrity of the church, the idea of the occult. He's been a leader or Disney has been a leader in socializing and making socially acceptable those practices which are prohibited by our Catholic faith. They're not warned against. They're prohibited. We're told not to do them. This is part of the same old Harry Potter shoot em up. This stuff is impious literature. It's impious subject matter. It's not for the Catholic. Got it. Well, two man car. We're going ten seven. We're on our way out, off duty. But uh, actually, we're always on duty for Jesus, even uh, when we get off the show. Kyle, thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Same Christ time, same Christ channel. God bless you and uh, keep the faith, my friend. Thank you, Jesse. You've been listening to Jesus nine one one. Spiritual Warfare, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, as you well know. Uh, we pray for you. Pray for us here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And I'll close with the St. Michael the Archangel. Defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan. And all evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us. St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray for us. Out. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, May the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.